Before we get into today's episode, I want to let you know that originally we recorded a super long episode. It was too long, so we split it up into some chunks for you. You'll first hear from Nate, Sarah, and I as we talk about studies on the Norwegian method. We'll also talk about a study about big riders and if they can actually process more carbohydrates than smaller riders. Super interesting discussion. You'll also hear us talk about a discussion about strength training that we have that with Nate in particular. Well, we saved that one for another episode because it just got too long. So enjoy the first two studies that we review here and then get ready for the next one to come as a special bonus throughout this week. Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee. Today we have with us Sarah Laverty from Trainer Road, our CEO, Nate Pearson. And we're going to review research today that is recent, that's fresh, that's interesting, uh, even one that's unreleased, but we got permission from the author. Uh, it's just waiting publication, peer reviewed, but it's pretty exciting. Uh, it's good stuff. We're going to start off with a very interesting study. Uh, it comes from the, now the Norwegian. I'm going to explain the context first. The Norwegian method is a thing that a lot of us have heard about in the spaces of triathlon in particular and cycling. If you've watched the Olympics, you saw some of the best endurance athletes in the Olympics were Norwegian. Christian Blumenfeld. We have, you know, Jakob Ingebrigtsen on the running side of things. And when you go to the Winter Olympics, they're going to be, in, uh, dare I say, even dominant in a lot of the endurance sports that happen in the winter uh, Olympics as well. Okay, Norwegians yeah. do it right, right? Like that's like the narrative that exists and they've got a special method is what exists. Now, this method many times is uh, misrepresented uh, very commonly. It's misrepresented as it's just boiled down to they do polarized training or it's boiled down to they use lactate meters or these different things. And that's not what it is. Um, common proponents of this really haven't come from the Norwegian side. They haven't said, we have a Norwegian method and here it is marketing. Instead, it's kind of been like other people describing it for them. And as such, a lot of things have been misunderstood. Now, this study is really interesting. It's titled Training Session Models in Endurance Sports, a Norwegian Perspective on Best Practice Recommendations. And I shouldn't actually call it a study. Instead, I should just call this a paper. This is a published paper of observations that have come from interviews with the uh, 12 elite Norwegian coaches, uh, if you add up all the different accolades from all the athletes that they've coached, it's over 350 international medals earned by those athletes. So that's, these athletes are the tip of the spear. So it's also, it's very important to keep in mind that they're tip of the spear athletes. Uh, I'm not a tip of the spear athlete, right? So perhaps how they train isn't how I should train, but the principles that we can get from it, we could actually glean some interesting things from this. What they did is they sat down and they interviewed these coaches about their coaching process. The interviews were about three hours each. And then what they did is they organized all the information that they got and they basically um, summarized it. And then they sent it back to the coaches to make sure that everything was accurate. The coaches signed off or said anything needed to change. And then they revised. And what we have here is a collection of observations from these interviews with 12 of the best coaches in Norway with endurance athletes. Now they span a number of different sports though. It's not just cycling, cross-country skiing, biathlon, rowing, speed skating, swimming, running, long distance running, triathlon, and road cycling. They didn't have mountain biking in there. That's a notable one. Gravel also didn't get a mention. Uh, <laughs> so, but just the same, we're going to focus on the principles that they talk about, but specifically the ones about cycling, because that's relevant to what we're talking about here. We might touch on some triathlon stuff too. Uh, so with all that context brought into this, the information included in this, and it's it's a pretty lengthy one to read, but I feel like it's a really great one to read for people. It's really interesting. But the information included in this includes everything from specific workouts that they have prescribed to their athletes and examples of those, to training principles that they follow, to periodization, to training volume, and time and zone. And this is a bit of a spoiler alert here, but there's no revolutionary Norwegian method that totally contradicts everything that we've ever known about training. So like it's training. <laughs> yeah, it's training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's too, too, yeah. John, I want to say too that like uh they they do get a lot of medals, but they don't get the most medals. Um, besides some winter sports, they don't get the they, a USA gets mo more medals. So is there a USA training method? With swimming, like you know what I mean? Like we do yeah. better than that. Um, but some it's of the true. winter sports, the 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 cold countries just get more like we in Reno, we have Olympians in Reno, which seems so weird That's because we have Lake Tahoe and ski resorts here where a lot of, a lot of kids don't have access to skiing their whole life. That's and right. That's, that's right. If your country's super cold, you're gonna be better at speed skating probably then. Yeah. Can, who wins curling? Is it Canada? Oh, is I that, don't know. I that's Scotland. a good one. 
Scotland? Scotland. Hell, I actually hell yeah, Scotland. did. I think they were pretty good. <laughs> Represent, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least I've heard That's of awesome. Scottish curlers. It's probably not South Africa, though, right? Like the the amount of no probably it's got to be yeah. a, it's got to be a cold place in general Watch. but anyways we're gonna be surprised but, yeah that there's scott I just there's wanna, south africans there uh, spoiler it's not like a special training method but two i don't want to frame it as in norway just destroys all other countries in the olympics because that doesn't yep. happen yeah but they do they're, right. they're very good at some things too and there's better um cyclists from other countries too certainly i just want to now frame it, when but, you but, look at the thanks nate yeah Looking at the size of the country, they punch far above their weight, right? Like, you know, compared to the population of the U.S. per capita, it, they, they're very impressive. There's quite a few examples of this across different sports as well, right? Where you see, you know, the, the actual population size, they produce really high performing athletes that come out of it. Um, Do you know how the most regardless, it's, oh, sorry, uh, in the Olympics? I just got, in, yeah. It was us. USA. USA. 126. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think we tied on golds with China. And then we, but we had more medals overall. Is that right? I think we had 30 or 33. Norway had eight. Not that I, Norway had eight. Yeah. 126. Now eight, population so. size. It's a bit different. They so, had four gold medals. With, we had 40. Just saying. There we go. <laughs> so, yeah. Very <laughs> different. <sorry>. Yes. <laughs> Norwegians are just going to be just flaming hate in the comments right no, now. No, <laughs> they're really good. I'm just, I just want to like make sure we don't think that they're like the dominant force in the world, but they are good. Yeah. Yes, they are very good. And and a lot of that's kind of been put into perspective. We had a few years there where we had Gustav Eden, well, prior to Gustav Eden, we had Christian Blumenfeld winning, like uh, setting the fastest time at Kona right after, or sorry, not at Kona. He wins Tokyo, which is a short course Olympic for cycling, for cyclists here. That's a short race, right? So we're talking roughly an hour long race. And then you're going into full distance Ironman, which typically like a really fast time was sub eight. And then Christian Blumenfeld, I think, set the record for the fastest full distance at Cozumel shortly after that. Um, and that's like, you know, within the space of two months. And then we had Gustav Eden win long course. And then Jakob Ingebrigtsen's dominating this middle distance running thing. And then on the skiing side, you have all of them having like uh, incredible performances. So um, so there's this narrative that built over a handful of years. And then over the last, I don't know, hasn't been long, really like 18 months or so, a lot of these figureheads for Norwegian athletes and endurance sports haven't had the same level of dominance. And I think a lot of people have really enjoyed kind of coming on and almost like knocking the Norwegian method down as a result of that. Um, but I think that, you know, putting all this in context, that helps us understand why there's so much hype around this whole thing you know, and, and why it might be justified or might not. So this is uh, I did the math and Norway for every, uh, gold medal is 1.3 million people for us. It's 8 million people to show you how much they're punching <laughs> so, above their weight. So go amazing. Norway. There's only like yeah. 5.4 million people in the whole country. It's incredible. That's, yeah. Right. We have cities like that. And that's across all sports, right? Nate. So it's not just, that's just endurance gold. sports. Oh yeah. Right. From summer Olympics. Seriously. Yeah. This summer Olympics. Yeah. Right. And if we look at winter, I'm sure that they uh, probably oh, that actually be hit a better average. You know what I mean? For sure. Um, especially sure. cross country skiing. Norwegians are really good. Um, and this study is really interesting because it's kind of like if you could get all of them in a room, like what consistencies can you find? Cause in many cases, it's not the weird oddball things that somebody does. Instead, it's the the thing that everybody does, and you want to find that, and then attach yourself to that, and that's what makes like success uh, more reliable to to come upon, and that's what they did really in this study. So it's really helpful and really cool and insightful. I want to quote something uh, when they when you look at this study and you look into the re results, um, and this is even on the abstract. You can find this. It says the interval training sessions revealed in this study are generally more voluminous, meaning there's greater training volume. And training volume is not, by the way, uh, volume a lot of the time is equated to hours that you do per week or something. And when they're talking about volume, they're talking about the combination of intensity and duration put together to create volume. I think that that's a very important distinction that needs to be made uh, for people to understand. So they're saying that when you look at this tip of the spear collection of athletes that have won over 350 medals, they say that they do more volume. They're more controlled, meaning that they have specific goals with their training rather than just randomly going out and doing them. And it's also less exhaustive. And what they mean by exhaustive is they mean going to absolute, like pushing a person to the point where they physically can't move anymore in their workouts. 
that sort of point of failure, true failure. They say that when you look at all this stuff, they are, there's more volume, there's, it's more controlled, and it's less exhaustive than most previous recommendations outlined in research literature. Now, I want to keep in mind, this is the best of the best in the world, but still, I wouldn't say that what I viewed in this study differs from what training should be, but rather differs from what it might actually look like in some cases when you look at it on like a broad, how does everybody in the world train that isn't a tip of the spear athlete? Instead, it just looks like what they're doing is if you were to read training and racing with a power meter, like they're just by the book. You know what I mean? And by the way, that's if if you are a psych, I mean, we're getting into the fall, good time to read books, right? To kind of like get some more time, do that sort of thing. It might be a bit dry for some people, but boy, if you read training and racing with a power meter, you will really understand so many details about how to train, particularly with power, but also just how the body adapts to training and how to dose the body and let it rest. It's awesome. Nate, I even think um, for a very long time at Trainer Road, we had it like as like a, well, not a mandatory reading, but we encouraged all of our employees uh, to read that. It was required, um, I think, for everyone. Let's hear like mm -hmm. a software engineer, but everyone else in like uh, support and uh, product management and marketing had to read it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's great. I'm reading in Spanish actually as we speak, and that's a really tough one, uh, but a good way flex. for me to work on Spanish. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, no, sorry, Nate. Yeah, yeah, that was a flex, I must admit. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's get into this. So there's a lot to cover in this. We are not going to go into everything. However, I want to pick out the most interesting and relevant things. And I think that... <clears throat> If I could find the most interesting and relevant things to guide a discussion on right now for all of us, and by the way, uh, Nate will interrupt me and I will interrupt Nate, Sarah will interrupt me, and I, just because if you were sitting down with your friends and having a discussion about this stuff, you would just jump in and ask questions. It's free-flowing. So uh, I, we are giving space for that. So if you're listening to that, go ahead. I want to have a discussion about this table. It's table five on page 24, and it's uh, referred to as common features. If I were to explain it in a bit more context, I might equate it to training principles that they found to be consistent across the board. And I want to talk about these, and then we can kind of share our thoughts on what stands out. Does that sound good? Sounds good. First one, hard, easy rhythmicity. And basically what they're talking about here, they say days of hard workouts. And when they say that they're talking about like interval training or extra long endurance days, which is cool because that is a great distinction to make that even those long endurance days are, can still be hard. They say days of hard workouts are systematically alternated with days of easy, low intensity training in between. And then they say most coaches advocate for two to three hard training days per week, and they call those key sessions. And they talk about during the preparation period. So that's like when a person is in like a builder specialty phase in the vernacular that we commonly use, that's when they would be doing that sort of thing. So, I mean, yeah, this, this makes sense, right, Nate, of these hard, easy days. And they found that across the board with all these coaches and these incredible high-level athletes. Um, that was not too surprising. Double intensive sessions. We've talked about double threshold before. I know Sarah's like keenly familiar with it too, just with uh, following track and field and everything else with that. Seven out of the 13 interviewed coaches practice double intensive sessions. Now keep in mind, these are not cycling coaches. The 13 coaches span all these different sports, right? It says, um, this is an example of this would be intervals, both in the morning and afternoon session of the same day. The main purpose is to increase the total volume of intensive training while managing recovery cycles and stress load. It's been described in other ways, in particular for running, for example. You can only accumulate a certain amount, like uh, if you try to do a threshold session for three hours running, like <laughs> you, you can't do that. And you're just going to be so cracked that you can't train not only the next day, but for days thereafter. So instead, just like interval training allows us to get more time at a specific intensity with splitting it up into smaller chunks, they do the same thing just on a larger scale of splitting it into different workouts. And they do a workout in the morning, and then they might do a workout in the afternoon. Now, let's keep reading on this. Uh, they mention uh, in long distance running, swimming, and triathlon, this approach is applied on zone three sessions. And they define zone three, we're going to get into this as like tempo and sweet spot, okay? So this is not like, um, so, so keep that in mind. Rowing and speed skating apply double intensive sessions in zone four to six. That's like going to be threshold VO2 and anaerobic uh, to increase the amount of training around race pace. So this is a really interesting observation because everyone talks about in terms of double threshold and it doesn't necessarily mean you need to be riding at a, or training at FTP and going all the way through. 
this is not mentioned when you talk about cycling training, when you look through this paper. I don't mean to imply that it's never been done and it isn't practiced, but it isn't mentioned as something that the cycling coaches apply to their athletes. I know we've gotten questions about if athletes should do split up their interval training into like two different times, then they can spend even more time at threshold. I simply haven't seen any evidence that advocates for that. What's it sounds like that, right? Yeah. And pro athletes that that's their entire, I guess, yeah, that, you know, those people, that's it. And even then, um, if you're really like, you know, those athletes can st tolerate so much stress and recover, they're genetically gifted at being able to do that. Their life is architectured to be able to allow that recovery. That's the, that's a huge, huge point is that a lot of times we see, like, I love this whole study, but we see pro athletes and we go, let's do what they do. And it is mm -hmm. impossible to do what they do. Uh, not just based on lifestyle, but your genetics. Yes. Absolutely. Or else you'd be a pro um, athlete. Yeah. All of us would do the same, right? Like, and it's, it takes the genetic lottery and discipline in organizing your life and saying no to so many things so that you can uh, just like fully recover from these sort of things. There's an interesting, and I'll link down to this in a video down below. Um, there's a, uh, there's the Norwegian method. It's called like, it's a video series that they've put out and uh, that you can see with um, Olaf Alexander Boo, I believe is his name. And he is the coach for, and I don't know if he participated in this, but he's the coach for Gustav Eden and Christian Blumenfeld and possibly others. And they are up at Sierra Nevada. Um, so this is in Spain and they're at this facility that's designed for endurance athletes to train. And it is a boring life, like flat out boring. They live in dormitories. They eat the same like white pasta and red sauce with meat. And it's like the, just like all they care about is just getting the carbs in and that's it. And it's, there's no distractions. They have a track up there and then they have great mountain roads that allow them to drop down to low elevation or go up to high elevation. And they have really good pools. And all they do is that. In fact, there's even a video of a guy that kind of jumps in like his, his whole thing on YouTube is he's a good all around athlete and he jumps in with the world's best and the different things that they do. I think he's done one with Alex Honnold and all these other ones. He went with Christian Blumenfeld and he was like, the food sucks. It's kind of not great. And then he's like, how in the world do they train this much? This is so boring. I can't believe they do this. And th all these athletes within this, that's how dedicated they are. So it's a grain of salt. And there's two, there's, um, Chrissy Wollerton's coach, famous dominating, um, tri triathlete, her coach, Brett Sutton, he was known for just taking athletes and just doing massive volume. And then whoever made it was going to be like an amazing world cool. champ and everyone else just That's got right. burnt out. And, and I mean, it's a way to find who has the genetics to do it, but it, it was not optimal for a lot of athletes and probably a lot of athletes could have had amazing careers, um, if they would have had a little more recovery and a little less volume, but yeah, produced Chrissy Wellington. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. for sure. An amazing athlete. Yeah. Uh, so the next section is cross training. I'm not going to go deeply into this. They don't mention that cycling had a lot of cross training. In fact, cycling is the most sport specific. When you look at the time spent doing the sport, it was, and that's like what their training comes from. It's like 90% upwards of 90% of their time is doing that. Whereas if you look at a sport like cross country skiing, for example, it's like 60% of their sport is actually, or of their training is doing their sport. Whereas with cycling, it's like 90% of their training time is doing their sport. So I'm going to skip over the cross training spot, but they basically say that for certain sports, it's really helpful. The next one is called few session models. This is an interesting one. Most coaches apply a limited set of session models. In other words, they're talking about workout structures um, within each zone for predictability and week to week calibration and control purposes. Uh, that smells like something that we talk about predictability and week to week calibration. Um, it's definitely the case. Like if you look at our workout library, there's a lot of different things that we have, and you'll see a lot of variations of like the same sort of format of a workout. Um, and it allows you to just kind of step through it. Nate, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just cheering. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's a, a cool thing that they point out. In other words, there are some coaches and I think there is, there's value in novelty and Nate and I, we, we talk about this a whole lot, right? In like training novelty, there is value in that. And there's multiple ways to accomplish a single training outcome. Uh, but many times I think from the outside in, we think that the secret is some like unknown workout structure that a certain athlete has that's beating us. And that must be it. When in reality, I think that we'd all be surprised that the world's best athletes, they aren't doing some crazy off the wall, weird interval structure. Instead, they're just intentionally stressing the body in a specific way with a certain type of workout 
allowing it to recover, and then stepping it up. Progressive overload, right? Like it's the basic training principles. Um, the next part they talk about is, it's interesting. It says, mostly controlled, very few, quote, all out sessions. Very few hard out or very few hard sessions, competitions not included, across the annual cycle are conducted to complete exhaustion, but rather with a quote reps and reserve approach. Foreshadowing for what we're going to talk about at the very end of this with strength training, and Nate's going to talk about some studies on strength training. The main purpose, the main purpose with this approach is to increase the accumulated work, working volume at high but not too high intensities to ensure that the athletes are sufficiently recovered for the next key session. We have to delineate here. This isn't talking about don't do high intensity. This is talking about don't do so much that you can't accomplish your next training session. That's what they're talking about. Hey, John. All out sessions. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sorry for this. Uh, somebody said like, I interrupt too much, but I got to add the context or else I'll just sit here for yes, totally. 45 minutes while John does a monologue. So on, <laughs> on our product, when you do the RPE afterwards of like what, when you do a workout, if you answer all out, which is that this is what we're talking about. One of those mass sessions, it's going to do a different, um, it's going to adjust your training much different to accommodate for that, accommodate for that all out than if you were to be like hard or very hard. And it also depends on the type of workout. If you're doing an easier, like endurance ride and you're like, that was very hard. Our system goes, Whoa, something's messed up right now. We, we need to adjust that because you should not be having a very hard, you know, air quotes, easy ride. But your VO2 max workout too, if, if you said it was easy, something else needs to be adjusted, right? Um, and then that's what the system is constantly doing those updates. And that I think the the all out answer would be one of those mm -hmm. sessions. I think we've all had it too, where you just, you could not make it or you barely made it. Or even if you, you failed a workout, right? That's another example of it smashing you. And then things adjust after that to get you back on track. And those happen, right? You, you sleep poorly, you do a little bit too much extra. Um, you get sick, all those things happen, you need to adjust. Yes. And then it states that when these sessions are incorporated into the training, when, then they're not frequent, but when is when you're getting closer within three to six weeks of your main competition. And this is what we see like with specialty phase training, right? In the sense that when you get into a specialty phase of training, you're going to have stuff that's more specific to the demands that you'll face on race day. They'll be tough, but then you'll be backing things off as you get really close to that event. So then you can take all that hard work that you that you put in and, and the changes that happen to your body, but still be fresh enough to be able to use it all. Um, it's, this is a great quote. I feel like every coach should hear this elite coaches seek sustainability and optimization through session programming, not maximization. Uh, man, that's like, and, and not just coaches, athletes too. We, we need to like hear that regularly and remember that. Um, and that's why we've kind of designed a system with trainer road so that it kind of protects us from ourselves. Our own ambitions seek maximization, but in reality, that's not the sustainable. <laughs> Sorry. Nate's very much. I'm saying yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nate's the famous maximalist. Um, and, but the thing is, that's what our ambition wants. But in reality, when we're talking about achieving a specific training outcome for like, and, and, and having high performance over time. Yeah. That's, that's not the way to go about it. So Again, nothing novel, but really good to review. Like these are good training principles for us to have. Uh, next one they talk about progressive intensity increases throughout the session. This is an interesting one and one that we've talked about quite a few times, Nate, and it's something I'd even encourage athletes to consider doing a bit more often. Uh, most hard sessions are performed with a slight progressive increase in intensity. And when they talk about slight, they're talking about, you know, an athlete has a range and that's uh, who knows, let's just add a 10 watt range for their target for their target that they have, right? And if you've ever done an outside workout, you'll notice this. And when you get your power targets, you'll have like a little range that you can have. It's not like the specific number, but you'll have a range to hit. And then they talk about within that range, over the course of a workout, they often see that with the world's greatest athletes, they might start toward the bottom of that range and finish toward the top of the range. It's nothing huge though. It's not like a person starts out and rides tempo. And then by the end of it, they're doing anaerobic efforts, uh, like a freshman kick. Instead, it's just, they allow that slight adjustment. And they even talk about endurance rides where they say that with long distance, long, slow distance sessions, typically start at the lower end of the intensity zone, then gradually increase to the mid or upper end of that zone as the session progresses. So again, this isn't crossing zone lines, but instead they're just talking about as it goes on, they aren't so eager that they just go all in on the first one. Even the world's best athletes are okay with turning down the intensity a touch on the first few ones to kind of get their feet wet and then they can do more toward the end. 
So I think that's really cool because we probably have in our mind that they just like nail everything to the max every time. But in reality, they don't. Is this ever measured in heart rate too? Because I know when I, every single interval, the intensity that I'm feeling oh. goes up, 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 and the heart rate goes up, 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 even though that's the wattage is the same. Point. And on endurance, the same. I, the wattage is the same, but then the intensity goes out through. So I'm not sure if they're, if they're talking about heart rate or that power here. Yeah, that's a, I hadn't caught that, Nate, but that's a really good point. So they, they define, and maybe I'll just go into really quickly how they define the zones, because I do think that that's pretty relevant. They use, because of the sports, right? And certain, like they don't have power meters in every sport that they're talking yeah, about here. Exactly. So what they use is they use heart, they kind of have a, like a table and it's almost like triangulation with using these different things in, in terms of how we perceive what is what happened in a specific zone. But they have a table and they talk about heart rate and they talk about blood lactate. They And then they also talk about percentage of VO2 max uh, that an athlete would be training at. And um, in terms of how that's measured, you'll notice that a lot of them use that VO2 master, which Andrew Sellers, by the way, a uh, good friend of mine. And I hope you're well, Andrew, uh, if you're listening to this, but he was, I think, one of the people involved with creating the VO2 master ma mask. And you'll notice that a coach like Olaf Alexander Blue, he actually uses that mask like directly when they come out of the water to measure like gas exchange and do that sort of thing. They use it wow. very heavily. So they may very well be measuring it in very different ways. But I do want to talk about the zones really quick because that will help us with the next thing that we're talking about. So they split everything into three categories, low intensity, mid intensity, and high intensity. Uh, the low intensity includes zone one and two, which we could equate to active recovery and endurance for the, the common nomenclature for power zones. In terms of blood lactate, how they measure this is less than 1.5 millimole per liter is zone one. Zone two is 1.5 to 2.5. That's talking about blood lactate. When you get into mid intensity, that's zone three, and that's 2.5 to 4.0. Now, we would equate this to tempo and sweet spot. Uh, and this is getting up into the point where you are getting into quote the threshold zone because we see they're going all the way up to four millimol, right? Just like sweet spot overlaps between tempo and threshold. And then when you get into zone four, that is more squarely within threshold, but possibly even overlapping into VO2 a bit because we're looking at four to six millimol. And then for zone five, which would equate roughly to VO2, it's six to 10 millimol. And then above that would be zone six, which would be kind of equivalent to anaerobic in terms of how we look at it. And that's anything greater than 10 millimol. So low, mid, and high. Low contains an active endurance and or active recovery and endurance. Mid is tempo sweet spot. High intensity is threshold and above to make it simple in terms of how they're defining it. So Nate, back to your point though, that could absolutely uh, make the data appear that way. That's a really interesting thing because we've all seen that. Like you can finish the first interval and you're like, I'm Superman when I look at my heart rate, right? Because it doesn't go up. And then you do the last interval and within one second, you're already to the max of the first interval, right? Because your heart's ripping and ready not, to go. Maybe not one second, but, and that's one reason why uh, I prefer power training rather than heart rate training, because if you were to keep your heart rate the same, your actual amount of power would go out down on each one of those intervals. And to follow this principle, the intensity, like, it, the intensity is what you're feeling is going to go up and your heart rate is going to go up per interval yes. and even on long rides. Yeah. Oh, totally. There's kind of like a theory that that's bad. The cardiac drift is the term that's applied decoupling, to this. Decoupling. Yeah. And yep. Heart rate decoupling. And it's, it's not inherently bad. There's nothing morally or inherently bad about it. Uh, in some, in some cases, some coaches seek that as a training outcome to reduce that. Um, but there's tons of ways to, to achieve that. And in the end, if you do more training and you're getting enough adequate recovery and that training is well-structured, that will happen. That will be an eight, that will be a byproduct of it. Now, um, it won't happen in perpetuity. Like it's, it's something that does have a point of diminishing returns. Everybody, no matter what you could train at the same like pace forever. And to be eventually okay. you'll reach a point where it will go up and you'll hit VO2 max. But yeah, that, and that Joel Friel, uh, popularized that for, uh, I think maybe he came up with it for triathlon. And mm -hmm. I don't believe there was any studies on it. He was just like, this is what I do for my athletes. And after a certain percentage of decoupling between heart rate and power, he said, hey, and the endurance um, session. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you can just kind of get the same outcome too from like getting the right power targets and duration rather than go until this happens, especially if you're outside on the road. That'd be pretty hard to be like, go until then and then drive back home. 
Uh, <laughs> Uber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or do loops or something. But that's that's kind of the history of that. And I, I don't know if it's the, you know, the there's a gold standard on that rather than that's what Joel Friel did with his af athletes. Yeah, great context. Thanks, Nate. Um, so anyways, a uh, very interesting point. The next one, they talk about combination of intensity zones. Um, and they say that they talk about the most used workouts, which we'll get to in just a bit. They say coaches implement sessions that combine training intensities, but it's not very often. They say that combinations of zone one and two are, are where the, you see that happen, zone three and four, and then perhaps zone four and five. Those are the most often. However, the kitchen sink narrative, like you've heard like kitchen sink style workouts where it's like... Uh, it's like Oprah handing out cars. It's like, you get an endurance interval, you get an anaerobic interval. And it's just like your workout looks like it's got a little bit of everything. Now, granted, I know that when we look back at our power files from a race, we think that that's what it was. Um, but that's not usually the most measured and precise way to go about training. And it's reflected in how these coaches prescribe their training too. They will combine zones at times, but it's usually adjacent zones. They're not looking at doing something that's wildly different. Um, I think that the exception that you would see most likely in this that really that wasn't articulated is things like hard starts or things like these um, anaerobic attack style ones where it's like boom, 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 on and offs. And then after that, you'll settle in at, at sweet spot or threshold for a short period of time. Those are actually very commonly prescribed workouts from what I've seen with the world's most elite athletes. Um, but it's still not doing randomization. And I think that that's the key with that one. It's not just crazy random. Uh, altitude training, they talk about how they use it, um, and how it's very commonly used and that they don't do crazy high intensity with when they're up at altitude training, but rather they focus on more lower intensity work typically. Uh, then they talk about, uh, some sessions as they get closer to when they're going to be competing, they might go up into zone three and zone four, but it's typically lower endurance stuff, uh, tapering strategies and, and, and easy weeks. During tapering or easy training weeks, about 50% shorter session duration than those presented in the first table, which that's just talking about typical workouts, um, are advocated. The main intention with such sessions is to decrease the number or the decrease the cumulative effects of fatigue while maintaining fitness and capacity. In other words, they use rest weeks and they use taper weeks, and it's typically a pretty significant reduction. And that's a change that we actually made, uh, man months, I mean, it's been years now, um, where with an introduction of adaptive training and everything else that we brought in, uh, we gained a lot of capabilities to be able to be more dynamic with those things. And people have gotten more rest and they're getting faster and it's really cool. So it's awesome. It takes care of it for you. Uh, okay. Uh, passive recoveries. They talked about, that's just talking about passive versus active recoveries, like doing nothing or actually moving between intervals and say that most people do a bit of both, but most people do passive recoveries, uh, or active recoveries on the cycling side that was mentioned within the text. Okay. Now these are the last three things that I want to talk about here with this section. Coaches focus prior to the session. This could also kind of align with athletes focus. The coaches spend considerable time on planning optimal sessions, often in cooperation with the athletes. The training content of key sessions are typically uh, typically presented one to seven days in advance to allow the athlete mental preparations. And that sounds exactly, that sounds like adaptive training. <laughs> sounds like what Trainer Road does, right? Uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, coaches focus during the sessions. The main focus during interval sessions is to provide technical feedback or guidance. Sounds like a workout text. Modify training load variables when necessary and assist the athletes with intensity control. Um, similar focus is pre present on low intensive sessions, although less frequent measurements for intensity control purposes are applied. So this is talking about the fact that during the session, they want to make sure that everything is going as it was intended. The athletes performing well, it's that analysis that you get. And then after the training session, most coaches practice debriefing and recapitulation of each session together with the athlete post-workout surveys and analysis of the, of the workouts, right? To pinpoint what worked well and features for improvements. The main intention is to create an arena for learning and enhance training quality for subsequent sessions. So, uh, this is really cool to see, like I, they didn't title this key tenets of like what we do when we train. However, these are common things that they find across all of these coaches. And I just think it's a really neat organization of this sort of thing. Um, if training and racing, uh, with a power meter is the template, this is kind of seeing it applied and getting a review of that. And I think that they both kind of complement each other really well. Um, a couple other last things on this one. So, uh, 
There's a table three on page 17, and we've linked to this study down below. So you can follow along and you can check it out with me. Uh, some key points. So this one's really looking at like all the different workouts that they would prescribe to the athletes. And it's having examples of like three different examples of what you would do in these different sports. Talks about how often those would get prescribed per week. Um, yeah, really kind of cool to see these examples, but everything looks very normal. Nothing really stands out as like, holy cow, I can't believe they do these crazy interval formats. There is a wider variety in training prescription than what is commonly discussed though. And a good example of this is what's is for zone three, zone four, and zone five. So I'm going to look, I'm just going to like read off the examples here. So for zone three, remember this is like tempo and sweet spot. They give an example workout of four by 10 uh, to 15 minute intervals with something and with rest in between there. Then they also say one hour of cycling at tempo to sweet spot. And another one, they talk about how competitions use this zone. And they talk about long tempo stages and mountain climbs and long, uh, long tour stages mainly occur in this spot. Now, zone four, which is one where I think we see even more focus on being very precise, like with threshold style work, right? Here's what they talk about. Four to eight minute or four by eight minute reps. That's one workout. Then they talk about doing ladders where you go from two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, and then back eight, six, four, two. And they also talk about motor pacing sessions where effectively you're going to be spending time all around there. Uh, so notably within that as well, um, is that we don't have these and actually I'll get to that point in a bit, but zone five is similar 10 by one to three, 15 to 25 minutes of shorter work that you mix in between. In other words, I think that there's this narrative that for each zone, you have to follow a very specific and very templated interval format. But this is evidence that even with cycling, that with these coaches, at least with the world's best, these people at the tip of the spear, they are not just doing one specific thing in each zone. And that's it. Instead, there's a variety for these athletes to be able to get the stimulus from, which I think is pretty cool. Um, that allows for novelty and makes things a whole lot more interesting when you're training and more engaging. Okay. There's one more table here. It's uh, table four, page 21. It's called loading factor organization. And this is basically like, how do we fit all these things in? What portion of your training is composed in each of these zones? Okay. Now, if you look at the numbers and break it down in terms of the minutes, I want to break down the training intensity distribution between how much time they spend in low intensity, how much time they spend in mid intensity, and how much time they spend in high intensity. I think if we all remember over the past, I guess it's it's really died off, but a handful of years ago it was don't touch the gray zone. It's 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 terrible for training. And the gray zone was referred to as mid intensity training, right? That's what they're referring to with the gray zone. And instead it was like you need to be very strict with not touching that and you need to go away from it. So Looking at the numbers that they put, they give a range. For example, they say for zone one, it would be common for somebody to accumulate somewhere between 120 to 420 minutes. I know that's a wide range, but we're dealing with the ranges that they give. Zone two, 20 to 60 minutes. Zone three, 45 to 60. Zone four, 20 to 50. Zone five, 10 to 30. And then zone six to zone seven would be four to eight. Okay, so that's minutes that they might accumulate throughout the week. If you look at those ranges and you look on the low end, that would give you a training intensity distribution between low intensity, mid intensity, and high intensity of 64%, 21%, and 16%. If you look at the average between the, or actually let's look at the high end. If you look at the high end, it's 76% in low intensity, 10% mid intensity, 14% high intensity. If you take the average and you split the difference between all this, Low intensity is 73%, mid intensity is 12%, and high intensity is 14%. So that does not, that is not like strictly polarized where they avoid the mid intensity zone. And oftentimes this whole Norwegian method, like people say it's polarized training and polarized training is commonly identified by an 80, 20 approach or something very close to that. And in some cases higher, like 95 to five even. So I think that this is great evidence to bring everything back down and ground it in reality in terms of what these Norwegian high level coaches are doing. And this is with cycling. Remember the numbers that I gave you right there, that isn't from the other sports. So this is just with cycling here. And when you look at it in this case, and it, it's for what it's worth, there's a lot of time spent in this middle intensity zone with all the sports, but with cycling in particular, it does not look like that strict 80, 20 thing that we've heard about so often. Um, so that's, that's a, that I think a, a really, uh, good observation from this too. The authors on the study, Jonathan. Yeah. There's um, a famous one on there, right? 
Indeed, there is who has been kind of, and I wonder how much of this, you know, it'd be great to ask Dr. Steven Seiler, who was one of the authors on this, if he feels like, like his words have been twisted or like taken from him or something else, you know what I mean? Um, Because a lot of this has been assigned with that, but Tonison is first author, and then there's uh, four other authors within there, and Seiler is one of them. (laughs) So yeah, this is a, that's an interesting observation to have. Now, Here's another great thing that they mentioned. They mentioned that they use a, quote, modified session goal approach instead of a very strict time and zone uh, way of structuring the training when they're prescribing their training. In other words, they aren't measuring the time spent during uh, during and between intervals in warmups and in cool downs and then vigorously calculating everything to find out if they perfectly fall within this like 80-20 split or some sort of training intensity distribution split. That isn't how they proactively guide the prescription in their training. Instead, they're focused on achieving a specific training outcome with a workout, which typically coincides with training an energy system in a relevant way for their goal. In other words, today we want to train threshold, so we're going to train that. Today we want to train endurance, we're going to train that, right? And uh, that's how they they go about it. So I think that we the the mania was pretty crazy for a long time about this in terms of people thinking that like every little detail was calculated and then you had to fall neatly within these zones and instead we see that it's a different approach so yeah. and to put context in that too um and please comment on the video because that'll get the circulation up but Tyler's <laughs> um you know original observation of polarized was it was observational was about uh, Norwegian cross country skiers right and then a lot of people and a lot of podcasts said that applies to cycling and now we see Siler doing this research and not seeing that in cycling inside of Norwegian athletes that's right so that's I'm just leave it right there like, yeah 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 neatly summated right and and, yeah. and um uh yeah it'd be really great to talk to him about it um because um I I even know I see I follow him on Twitter and or x and i even see like when he talks about doing really long tempo sessions and like just riding in the gray zone for a really long amount of time so i'm not sure he hates the gray zone as much as everybody has made it out to be <laughs> you know i think it, uh, it too depends on what you're racing for like keegan doing these really long unbound things like we know his training hmm. dom- most dominant u.s like oh yeah athlete yeah. right now and he is uh he does a lot of sweet spot like Yes. A ton, which would be in the, you know, in the original polarized model would be the gray zone and it would be, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't think you'd be able to win every single <laughs> long distance yeah. race if you did that, but you would. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, John, I don't know if you can talk to that more without, spot. without talking about his training. Too yeah. Much. And there's, man, there's something, I know if listeners, you're probably not going to love this, but Nate, th- thanks for bringing this up because I have to talk to you about something after. I, I can't do it on air because it would reveal oh, can't people's wait. training, but I have oh, to talk to you, you after tea? about something really, yeah, we got tea, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> it will be spilled, but not on air. Um, uh, and it's, it's. Re- I think that, how do I approach this? Um so there are, there are a lot of different approaches for different athletes. And the, like we talked about, there are different ways to accomplish a similar training outcome. There are pros and cons to them though. Like, uh, and I would say that even like uh, Keegan, his threshold's so high and his power to weight ratio is so high that he probably uh, is allowed to get away with having a less crazy powerful snap in VO2, even though he still out sprints people at finishes and does all that stuff. He's a remarkable athlete. But I would argue that if Keegan spent less time doing that stuff, he could build a better sprint and a better snap and that sort of thing. And that's not a statement about Keegan as much as it is just anybody where we spend our time focusing is where we get the benefits, right? And in this case for him, it's very applicable since he races alone a lot of the time in breakaways and off the front and doing that sort of thing. It benefits him to have a very robust, like a a high fractional utilization, or in other words, like the ability to ride at a very high percentage of percentage of your threshold for an extended period of time, an abnormally high period of time. So long. And that's, he has the weird, he has weird numbers in that regard. Like when you look at it, he's, you know, his ability to ride at 90% of his threshold is superhuman compared to what the book says, right? Like, and it's because he has genetic lottery. It's because Mm -hmm. he is the most disciplined athlete I've seen in terms of organizing his life so that it leads toward performance. He has all these things, puts in all this work, so and then specific work to allow himself to ride at that sort of intensity for that sort of time. So when you kind of put all those pieces together, it's very logical, it makes sense, but I do question, 
I think, a, and a lot of approaches work for a lot of athletes, but there are some athletes that are performing very well and I have insight into their training and I'm, uh, I, I'm just a bit shocked that that's the way they're training. So that's the T that we'll talk about afterward. So to Keegan, um, he used to race world cups, right? And world cup races are extremely intense and like on off and really hard. And he did not do, he still was like mid pack or like, you yeah. know, upper third yeah. a little bit, which is amazing, but he wanted to win. Right. And he wasn't able to keep up with like Meninos and stuff. Uh, and it turned out his physiology was geared more towards let's go 90% of FTP for 10 hours. I mean, that's an exaggeration, <laughs> but that's, yeah. that's what, that's what he's good at. And then on top of that, what he is really good at is eating more than anyone his size should ever eat. Maybe that kind of dovetails telling what Sarah's going to talk about, but <laughs> it is, uh, it is. <laughs> crazy how much he can eat and then also the other one is consistency that guy is oh, yeah. so 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 consistent he's a machine oh, yeah um i think if, if any of us look back at when we were really fast we were consistently up to it there's oh, never yeah. like That's a time it. where we're like you know what i did is a big training camp and then i was just really fast it's like no i was consistent for like three or four months in a row i didn't get sick i took the easy days i really did the well in the hard days and i just put in the work over and over again and that's when you get fast yeah. Um, I think that that's the, that's the not very appealing from the outside in, but that is yeah. the key to getting faster. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we want the secret workout. So this is really, uh, this is just a really interesting, um, uh, study, or I should say observational, uh, paper to be able to read. Um, I do want to mention one other thing too. They talked about uh, another observation I have is that threshold intervals are not as long as is commonly associated with, quote, pro cyclist training. I remember reading like Phil Guyman's book and he talked about like, uh, I think when he started training with um, what is now EF, but then I think was the Garmin team, uh, they, they like basically like they were like, you need to 15 to 20 minute intervals, man. That's the money maker. If you want to be a fast pro, that's what you got to do. And and I think that 15 to 20 minute threshold intervals are money makers for what it's worth, by the way. <laughs> like when you can do those, it's awesome. But we do have to step our way up to it. And I think it's notable that within this, when they talk about example workouts, that they don't have 20 minute intervals. Instead, it's closer to 10 to 15 range is where they're looking at. So I think that there's a thought that unless you're doing really long intervals of threshold, like you're really not crushing it how you should. And instead we see an example from the world's best athletes. They aren't out there doing 15 to 20 minute threshold intervals every time. Otherwise, I think they would have noted that as like one of the key examples of a workout within this, this uh, thing here. I may be wrong, but that's my observation and interpretation of it. And then also there seems to be a greater focus on limiting rest between intervals than is often communicated. Like let's take the example of the 15 to 20 minute intervals again. I've heard many times like it discussed with, and this is from speaking with coaches that are very notable to speaking with, uh, athletes that are very high level athletes that, well, like it's not really, it doesn't really matter how much rest I have in between my interval. Like I just need to get the intervals in. And that doesn't really jive with when you look at what you're trying to accomplish in most cases with training, it doesn't really jive with what we understand about how to, achieve progressive overload with the body. Um, instead, limited rest is something that's there. And when you look at this, the limited rest is pretty strict that they use and the ranges are pretty tight that they use for the different zones on this paper. So rest between intervals, I've, I've often talked about like, and it, I, I take a lot of personal pride in this and I totally, you know how like Floyd Mayweather or somebody else or like right now, Jake Paul and like Mike Tyson, how they, they might frame in their mind that like they hate each other and that one's insulting another and that fires them up. I totally do that with training, but just like I use everybody else in my mind, not a specific person. So <clears throat> when I'm training, I'm like, uh, yeah, you might be able to do the same time that I did at threshold, but I didn't miss at all in terms of time between. It was on the second, I had four minutes to recover and I was able to do that work at four minutes rest between intervals and it did, and I nailed it. So like you go ahead and go do more of it and you can, yeah, you can rest in between for as long as you want, but that means that you're not as good as me. Like the rest between intervals, I know that we focus on the work, but when you are strict with your rest between intervals, I think that that is a, a very key area of focus, like worthy of focus for athletes to not sleep on that. When you can really tightly control that, you're also controlling the stimulus in a really meaningful way. Yeah, yeah, it's that progressive overload. And what we see in our own data is that if you even like increase it by 30 seconds, the 
air, like the failure rate or like how yes. the compliance of the workout goes up so much, meaning the workout got easier for people when they extend it more. So if you, this VO2 max is a great example. If you did a VO2 max interval and you had three minutes of rest, then you had 3.30, the 3.30 makes that whole workout easier. Thus you're having not the same progressive. And there is a time where you're gonna have 3.30, right? Mm -hmm. But then when you're moved to three, do three minutes of rest. And then move to 2.45, do 2.45. Uh, in, yeah. Again, that's a, when you're outside, you gotta find a place that you can actually have those those intervals at the right time. And I think we've all done, we've descended and mm -hmm. your, your intervals way, um, way longer than it needs to be uh, for rest or that it should be. So you gotta just be conscious of that. And of course, train indoors, especially as we're going into the winter for the Northern hemisphere. Um, yeah. You can just nail those, that structure and really get that progressive overload. That's really scientific stacked on each other. Um, that like, if you do the workouts, you are getting faster. 100%. Yeah. Well said. Sarah, does any of this, like, uh, what are your thoughts on this coming from like a running background track is like, so regimented with like a lot of the things there and cross country and everything else, but any observations yeah. from this that stand out to you? Yeah. I was actually going to come back to Nate's point about consistency. Um, and I just wanted to ask Jonathan. So am I understanding this correctly, that the 12 Norwegian coaches, they were more similar in their approach than they were different seems that way that's the yeah. at least what's discussed like when you read the paper they don't discuss that specific point however they do notice a striking amount of similarities and that's kind of the whole premise of the paper right and then if we go back to like the original uh discussion at the start um we were talking about how norway are very successful and have been for a while now with endurance sports um and if we're thinking then that these Norwegian coaches are all quite similar and they're all just applying these basic principles that we've known to be true, um, or at least like they uh, are are backed by science time and time again, um, and compare that then to sometimes these other philosophies become that are more extreme on one end or the other become like popularized. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder whether the Norwegian coaches are just better at being consistent at applying these like very basic principles. Mm. And it then allows their athletes to be consistent and then they get these consistent results. And it just like that speaks for itself. Um, that is pretty simple. <laughs> I do have a theory. That's a really good observation. I have a theory on mm -hmm. this. Um, one of the key things when you when from what I've heard from Norwegian coaches themselves when they talk about key tenets of the Norwegian method, one of the main things is being adhered to data, getting as much data as they can then being adhered to that. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons why they are so consistent in sticking to these things, Sarah, is because mm -hmm. they probably have, instead of following theory, instead of following even like, you know, one new paper comes out that challenges the status quo, and then you just jump full into that direction, like a fad, like we often hear. Mm -hmm. They're, they rely enough upon data that it takes a significant amount of new data to sway them from of, to change the outcome that you get from the data that's there, right? They're collecting as much as they can, and they're observing that. I think that that's what you get from a data-driven approach, just more consistent. You know? Yeah, definitely. And it leads me to think of things like, um focusing on those outcomes so like the data the out the data is the outcome right um and we often hear of like these studies even with like as it applies to nutrition and how that impacts then the mechanisms behind um outcomes it's like i think about if i've ever tried to do like fasted training where there is some like science to suggest that there are mechanisms behind that but I have never performed or never had the power or never had the speed to suggest that that is actually effective at allowing that progressive overload, then I, they're just probably better at, as you said, they're better at just like um, not being uh, distracted by those like exciting theories. Um, yes. Yeah. It's really an, a good lesson for all of us. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that come up that are, seem like really shiny, new, crazy, and off the wall. And we think it's the secret. Uh, we think it's the holy grail and the secret that we lack, you know? Mm -hmm. What we're talking about in these principles too, I think if we looked at other countries, 
it would be, it might not just call it a Norwegian method, it would be called the Japanese method, the Chinese method, the US method, yeah. depending on what yeah. country you mm -hmm. looked at, because it's um, it, what, what makes champions. And do a little pitch here, this is exactly, we, we like this because it, it, their principles are what we already do at Trina Road, and we manage it all for you at the progressive overload, tracking how fast you are, where your levels are, stepping you through it, hard days hard, easy days easy, doing the taper weeks, um, doing the more specialty focused workouts as you get closer to your race that mimic it rather than uh, some of the base stuff earlier on. And allowing you two or three days of intense work per week and capping it at that. Like Exactly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. a little, I'm going to uh, uh, tease something that is pretty Ooh. close. I say that often, but <laughs> one issue <laughs> we actually issue. by the way one, one thing on that we've actually outlawed us from saying close uh as like uh yeah it's it's, it's last funny. time like, i said it yeah go ahead yeah it like within product means and anytime somebody says we're close everyone goes oh like <laughs> 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 you know yeah because that's how that's how software development is like uh you think you're close and and uh surprises happen last time i said this in the forum i said hey we're pretty close to this and someone's like you always say that, blah, 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 blah. When is this going to come out? And I was like, Wednesday. <laughs> and I was like, yes. <laughs> that one, that one I, we actually nailed with two activity types um, being pulled into trainer road, which also goes into this. So one issue that we've had, and we've had so much guidance on the forum, on the podcast and support and blog articles is picking the right volume for you. And um, oh, man. we had we like- share this right now. It's exciting. Oh yeah, we are. Let's go for it. You know, we've <laughs> okay, had our, we're committed. <laughs> our low, mid and high volume plans. And, um, the, a lot of people have chosen high volume. We've had a warning. Don't do high volume. The high volume was literally check the data for like 1% of the athletes there. And we even had like an attack video that just framed high volume. It was like, this mm -hmm. is too much. Like, yeah, it is too much. Unless you're like, seriously like <laughs> pro 1%. level like yeah exactly the one percent and even that you might not even need that much and i i, I kind of wish we never would have put that out to the masses or you needed to like email support or something to get that that plan because what yeah. we had is too many people would pick um myself included plans that were more or bigger for them and what we are building and is in final testing at the moment is the ability where we you know we suck in all your data and we dynamically build a plan that is correct for your volume. What has one choice from you, which is your training approach. And your training approach is kind of like, how hard do you want to push right now in this like plan? And we have different training approaches where um, the recommended one is going to be balanced. Balanced means you have a good um, uh, balance between your rest and your intensity. And as you move forward, it's, it's really going to be like your long-term plan. Sometimes you're like, you know what? I want to just kick it up a little bit. I'm going to sleep extra. I'm going to um, eat extra. I don't have a stressful time at, at my work. Um, I'm ready to take it to the next volume level, uh, the next step up. And that's going to be either a demanding or aggressive approach. And then on the, on the opposite side, sometimes you're like, you know what? I just want to maintain. I'm going to be right here. And you can get a conservative or moderate training approach. So there's five choices. And then based on that, we will give you a training plan that is um, geared towards your data that takes into account all of your training and gives you a training plan that you can then execute a recommended one. You can still edit it and stuff that if you wanted to, but this is, it's so exciting because if we get people on the right volume and you know what that first week too, when you do that volume should not be brutal. Like, right. If yeah. that first week you're like, Hey, I can do this. You like, it's so tempting to say, I want a little more. Don't do it yeah. then right? Wait till you get through that third week. <laughs> so often that first two, those first two weeks are good. Um, it's like, it's and, like grabbing, it's like grabbing pie at the buffet. Like at first we want the whole entire pie and then just yeah, eat a right? piece and sit for a bit. And then you'll, then you'll see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. That's exactly right. Um, yeah. so again, that's in, I, we're actually going to start using it with some of our, we do onboarding calls for people. So if you sign up for trainer road, uh, during the signup process, you can actually schedule an onboarding call with one of our, uh, athletes or sorry, one of our support agents, so many of them athletes, one even just went to the Olympics. That's how good have, we are. <laughs> yeah. And then one of them in two weeks, uh, the other one, another one, won Cape town cycle tour. Another one is going to, um, marathon mountain bike world championships to represent his country as well. Like in, in a couple of weeks, uh, yeah, there, there's tons of them. They're the so same. crazy. Yeah. They, they know what they're doing. 
<laughs> exactly. And we also, for then a lot of other uh, support agents that we have that are not world-class athletes, they're certified coaches. We have gone through the process with USAC to learn and to understand. And then they're surrounded by all these like high level athletes and in this environment where they, they gain this really yeah. great understanding. It's awesome. It's, it's definitely a culture. So there are some, um, some sport agents aren't active cyclists, but they've had training and context and a culture of five, six years of all of this. And they understand it, I think better than a lot of coaches do. Um, yeah. and they are, definitely understand the product. So that is, that again, I think what we're going to do is we're going to start using it for some of the onboarding people and guide it through with some of the testing. Um, I think we've had all of our cyclists here use it. We had a couple bugs that we're working through of, of stuff, mm -hmm. but that's very, very exciting. And that will be, um, um, when you build a plan and train a road, that's going to be there. Oh, and the other cool thing, two days to six days, three days, yes, four day plans, just gonna mention that. five day it, plans. What, what, it could generate something that would just be two days per week and then three, four, five, or six days per week. So no longer, like you said, originally with this, there's no longer the low, mid and high volume, but there's, yeah. there's much greater granularity. And it's cool because, um, Nate, you said it, so it, it looks at you historically and what's worked for you historically. And then it looks at what you've been doing recently, and then it understands how to train you to get the best results with the current set of circumstances that you have. Uh, it's really cool. This is not the, the, this is milestone two, but uh, we're also gonna do monthly check-ins, then update your volume. Because just because it was good at one time, when you move forward mm -hmm. and you, you didn't do it, or you were able to handle a little more and your RP was right, then we can adjust your volume from there. Um, so anyway, that's, that's gonna be a, such a huge improvement so that we prevent people from shooting themselves in the foot, either by doing mm -hmm. too little or too much to really become faster and be consistent. Yeah, it's great. It's exciting stuff. Can we go into Sarah's study? And then, uh, Nate, can we do your strength training one at the end? We can. Stay tuned for strength training if you like it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be good. Um, Sarah, this is the unreleased study, is it not? Um, yeah. Exciting. Yeah, this is, um, it's not released yet, but it has been accepted um, by the Journal of Sport and Nutrition and Exercise Metabolism. So um, Dr. Podlegar uh, sent us to us and um, yeah, we had like some um, prior uh, insight into it all. So um, we'll just get right into it. The question was, um, do larger athletes have a greater capacity to utilize more carbohydrates on the bike than smaller athletes? Um, so Nate mentioned earlier that Keegan um, seems to have a wild ability to take in a lot of um, food. Um, but this study is actually, the current guidelines they they are in um with respect to body weight so they suggest a, a standard amount for everyone um which is typically around uh 30 to 60 grams for anything up to two and a half hours and then 90 grams um for exercise that lasts longer than that um but Dr. Podlegar um and uh, his colleagues uh speculated that larger athletes have well there is research to suggest that large athletes do have larger organs. And so they thought that they might have a greater ability to absorb more um, glucose um, because they have these larger organs. So how did they study if the larger athletes have a greater capacity to oxidize exogenous carbohydrates than the smaller athletes? Um, so exogenous meaning the carbohydrates that they have consumed while they're cycling, as opposed to the endogenous that they have stored um, in the form of glycogen. Um, so they measured the carbohydrate oxidation um, while the athletes were exercising. Um, the athletes ranged from 55 kilograms to 110 kilograms. So a wide range in size. I want to figure that out in pounds really quick. So 55 kilograms to pounds, that's going to be 121 pounds. And then 110, you said? on the other Yeah, side? 110 kilograms. So that's yeah. 242 pounds. Um, so huge range that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Double. double. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
So they split those um, athletes into large athletes and small athletes for a comparison. And the large athletes were over 70 kilograms and the small athletes were less than 70 kilograms. Um, Both groups exercised at 95% of their lactic threshold while consuming 90 grams of glucose an hour. The researchers then measured how much uh, carbohydrate they were oxidizing and then looking to differentiate between what was exogenous carbohydrates um, that they were using and how much was coming from their glycogen. They do this by, um, they attach a tracer to the the glucose that they're consuming on the bike um, and then by analysing their breath, they're able to distinguish between those two. Super clever. That's cool. Like they can because it's carbon 13 right is the thing that they attach and then that way they can see if what they're breathing out has carbon 13 and then they're like oh okay that's exogenous that's super cool yeah really really science is neat (laughs) yeah (laughs) um so what did they find they did find that the larger athletes were oxidizing more of the carbohydrate they consumed um while on the bike by around 13 grams an hour the difference between the two groups but you might be thinking that doesn't like surprise at least when I first read it it didn't surprise me tremendously because um the larger athletes are likely uh, or they are exercising at a higher absolute exercise intensity so they yeah they're putting out more power and so they do need more carbohydrate and so it wasn't surprising then that they they found that um, they were actually using more of those carbohydrates. So then they addressed this um, concern or or question or doubt um, by having the larger athletes exercise at the same absolute exercise intensity as the smaller athletes. Um, so same so, power? Yeah, so reducing their power by um, about 20%. And then doing the same study. So having them consume 90 grams of glucose an hour for the two hours. Hold on. Before you go any further, 90 Mm -hmm. grams of glucose, that's very different than the typical carb mix that we hear about, Sarah. Typically, if it's a two to one ratio and you're taking in 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour, 60 grams will be coming from glucose. 30 grams will be coming from fructose in a two to one ratio. And I think a lot of that is probably based on the assumption that like we can't, and maybe this is the old assumption that we can only take in, or we can only process and utilize 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour in an active state from the body. Uh, but what you're saying here is that there is no fructose that they're looking at. It's just flat out 90 grams of glucose straight out, which yeah. defies that traditional guideline. Right. And I think the rationale behind that was to completely saturate the glucose transporters in the intestine so that they can then unveil differences. Um, So if they didn't try to saturate that, then they might not see those differences, say, in the larger, we might not be hitting those limits for the larger athletes. Um, So it's to uncover any differences. that might be left if we didn't kind of push that envelope. Um, but as Jonathan was saying, yeah, the kind the current understanding, and actually my understanding before reading this paper was that we had this fixed upper limit, um, which is why we see those ratios, the two to one, and then more recently the um closer to one to one, one to point eight. That's kind of why we have that um those ratios uh, at the moment that's why we see them um but yeah so they were just trying to uh make sure that they see they they cover their bases basically <laughs> more is better right nate like <laughs> they're just <laughs> go to the limit or else you're never going to find it right yeah I mean, yeah i'm saying <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so when the larger athletes uh, reduced their exercise intensity and then compared that again to the smaller athletes, they still found that the larger athletes were oxidizing more of the carbohydrates they consumed um, on the bike. Albeit, the difference was smaller. There is question whether the difference then became physiologically applicable or not. Like if it actually it, would change performance to a meaningful degree? 
Right, exactly. Yeah. And how much stock they can put in that. I think they were saying that they would still like more research looking into the effect of intensity. Mm. But if we then look at the correlation analysis, which they did, uh, they actually added in some more participants. So they had about 15 participants in this study and they strengthened the the power of the uh, statistical analysis by adding in more participants who were exercising under identical conditions. So basically just strengthening the results of the correlation. And they found that there was a, a strong positive correlation between the amount of carbohydrates we're able to utilise and body size. So in other words, if you're bigger, you can oxidise more of the carbohydrates you consume. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. I've been saying this for like six so years. Long. I know. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Um, and I really, oh, sorry, Jonathan, you go ahead. I was just going to say, and I'm looking at your, this is from the study. I bet you're going to talk about like the rate that they found. Cause that's mm-hmm. the interesting point to me is like, it, it's what, uh, actually you, you just go ahead. Sorry. I was just getting yeah. ahead of myself. I'm excited. No, about no, this part. not at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the rate that they did found, so, um, the rate that came out of this correlation was uh, 0.7 grams of glucose per kilogram of body weight per hour. So that would be for, say, um, a 50 kilogram person, that would be 35 grams of glucose an hour. And then for, you know, the 100 kilogram person, 70 grams of glucose an hour, which is, uh, it is beyond that, well, at least for the 100 kilogram person, that's beyond that 60 um, gram limit that we thought um, originally. And they actually found that the largest person in this study had their peak rate was 90 grams an hour. So, well, uh, yes. that's, heart, and that's just of glucose. That's just of glucose. Yeah. Uh-huh. And this person so, was, I'm sorry, but this yeah. person I think was 200 centimeters, right? That's like six, seven. Oh, I didn't look at that. Nate, yes, were you? Yeah, yeah. Nate, did you? Uh, did you participate <laughs> yeah. in the study? No, recently? I'm only six. <laughs> I'm the 198. Because <laughs> I think too, like looking at this. Oh no, that's sorry. That's six. 200 centimeters. I'm sorry. Is uh six, six five and a half, six six. I think too. It's probably more based on height than weight. Yes. Because you can have a a five four person who's 220 pounds, or a six six mm-hmm. person who's 220 pounds. Um, and the difference, but you can see in the study they said that the maximum height here was 200 centimeters, and I'm guessing that was the person that had the most. 90 an hour. Right. 90 an hour. That's, yeah, that's what doesn't count uh-huh. fructose. That's just glucose. Right. Yeah. So, that, so if and we that add supports, in fructose. Yeah, I was just going to say, Sarah, add in the fructose, do it at roughly a one to one ratio. I don't know if you could even tolerate that, but that's like 180 grams per hour, like that right. you could theoretically be taking in. I'm thinking about the rates that I've heard about in triathlon, like really high rates, and athletes like Sam Long, very tall. Athletes like Magnus Ditlev, very tall. A lot of these athletes that are taller like this, I have heard that they take in more. Whether they're actually right. oxidizing all that, who knows, right? But it's interesting that this research kind of tends to align. On top of that, if there's a chart here, you should see their lactic threshold and their threshold or, or power to weight ratio, that the large group, their lactic threshold is only 200 plus or minus 22 watts. And they're, uh, their watt kg is 2.3 plus or minus 0.3. So they're in the, like, these this is kind of, yeah. Yeah. These are like kind of not untrained, but they're, they're like on the lower end of, uh, at least trained road cyclists. I, I got to think if you train up and you're at three and a half watts per kilo and you got a 270 FTP and you're six, five, I bet you, you're going to absorb more. I, that'd be interesting that they would mm-hmm. do next to see if, if mm-hmm. the rate of absorption but what we saw there at higher wattages, it does absorb more, which is makes sense because at that lower wattage, especially for the bigger people, they're going to be per, um, a higher percentage of um, uh, fat utilization versus carbohydrate. So I could just see then it absorbs slower at the same time. But that would, that would also be an interesting follow-up study. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I think even it's um, validating for our, like larger athletes because I feel like intuitively they know that they need um, a large amount of carbohydrate. But also I think for smaller athletes, it's, it is reassuring to at least like I know that I wouldn't be able to, like if I was to try and consume 
200 grams of carbohydrate like I would just I would be in pieces my stomach wouldn't handle it um so just having that more like realistic goal we've got something to aim for um and I think and I think that's helpful for for everyone who lies on like wherever you lie on the spectrum it's it's super fascinating it and it this is definitely a great example of what happens in research when you learn something or you observe something and then it opens up an entirely new set of questions and things to test. But this, without something like this, I don't feel like uh, you can't really cross a whole lot of bridges later on. Like this is this was an important one to cross. And it mm-hmm. this whole concept that body size could be correlated to glucose oxidation rates, like you said, sir, helps other athletes feel like, oh, okay, maybe I don't need to take in 180 grams per hour. And, you know, and then on the other side, maybe they do. And, but man, what if adaptation can even happen for the athletes that are taking in 35 grams per hour and they can get their way up too, right? Right. Mm -hmm. This blows out so much recommendations for years, right? Yes. Fitness companies and gel sizes, like this kind of, I think rocks the nutrition world endurance sport. Yep. I want to have a follow-up study where imagine they take these athletes down, the same people, and they follow them over six months where they actually, let's say they use Trainer Road, they actually raise their FTP 40 watts and they try to increase their carbohydrate utilization. Um It'd be fascinating. Like, right? And then see where people can get trained. Like, Because that's the other one is we think this is possible. We've seen this, but can you train your gut to handle more? I think we've all experienced this. We've seen them pro teams, but like, what if we measure it? And then- you see these lines with the, yeah, right? Like, then that changes everything again. And then people yes. would actually, I think if, imagine how much more you would use during training if you had scientific hard proof that if I do more, I will then be able to take in more. It's like your fourth discipline. Oh, well, that's, right. that's for, uh, that's for uh, triathlon. It's your second yeah, discipline yeah. for cycling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's super, man, th- this, uh, like you said, Nate, I do believe that this does, this should rock the foundation of the nutrition world. And it should cause everybody to step back and re-examine the rate at which you can adapt to it. Because we know like training, for example, that we know that if you dose the body with specific training, that's well-structured with balanced recovery, everything else that you can have improvement rates. Right. And, and you can kind of, you, you kind of know what those are. Like somebody isn't going to go from a hundred watt threshold to a 400 watt threshold into the course of a year. Um, just like, you know, if a person just gains one or two Watts and it's at, you know, 100 Watts down there below, that's underachieving. It'd be really fascinating if we could kind of get more data on this and understand what that oxidation rate is and where the point of diminishing returns is, because boy, think of all the athletes. You mentioned Chrissy Wellington earlier, right? And this approach of kind of just like throwing it at the wall and seeing what sticks, <clears throat> I wonder there's, um, oh, Jonas Abrahamson, I believe is his name. He was the rider in the Tour de France in the polka dot jersey. And I'm bringing this up and I hope that what I, uh, and I hope that in mentioning this, I can break down stigmas about body shape and size. Okay. So he did not quote, look like a climber. He was strong, like very strong. And he mentioned that when he was younger, he was striving and doing everything that he could to be a climber. Right. And that was it. And then he changed his approach and he was like, I am going to fuel and that's my main thing. And I'm going to gain weight and I'm going to become a better cyclist as a result of this. And I wonder how many cyclists similar in this respect are out there like, no, like I can't take in that many carbs and I shouldn't take in that many carbs. And I know this sounds crazy and someone's going to get angry about this, but that's fine. What if the ideal for performance is around 180 grams of carbs per hour? We don't know. Like, so, so you can't call that disqualified. We just simply don't know if it is. And if we were at that level, how many athletes would be better nourished, have more sustainable trajectories, better health outside of everything with their training? Cause we're burning so many calories when we ride. So mm-hmm. there, you know, this could totally, this could totally change the sport. We're already seeing times from Tade Pogacar or Tade Pogacar and everybody else that are the fastest times ever done on these climbs in the tour and the Giro, everything else. I feel very strongly that the largest contributing factor to that is fueling, not just fueling in the moment, but fueling constantly through their training. And it's allowing these athletes without something like EPO to have a level of performance that is just so high. Now, whether they're doing other things, who knows, but everybody's fueling better. The average speeds of the, te- of the Peloton is faster. People, the gaps between first and last on the stages is way closer than it's ever been. And I think fueling is the thing to, to blame there. And boy, how cool would it be if we're all just the sky's the limit and we can do more. This is, 
we've talked, I've always wanted to make a nutrition product because it's so important and mm -hmm. just make one that's like not super expensive. Uh, yeah, totally. Right. And not make it like, cause we don't need to, we make money from software and just be like, here you go. Use this to get faster with trainer road. Um, it just, it's a lot of work and we want to focus on software, but man, I just think yeah. there's such benefit. Like you said, such, such benefit, uh, mm -hmm. after power-based interval training, it's like nutrition and oh, yeah. hopefully you're getting sleep, obviously, but it's harder than <laughs> yeah. double your sleep or something like that where you can for double sure. your nutrition. Sarah, that was awesome. Thank you uh, for breaking it down. That's it for the first part of this conversation and stay tuned later on in the week for the discussion on strength training with Nate.